This is a finite planet with a finite resource base. On Earth today, uh, if we divide all the ecologically productive land and waterscape among the current population, there's only about 1.8 hectares per person. But to maintain the average North American requires seven, eight, nine hectares per capita. So we have built up a huge deficit. William Rees is a Canadian economist and ecologist. He's the co-founder of the eco-footprint concept, the globally accepted method of measuring our resource use. And he has concluded that our civilization is likely to collapse if we don't reduce our consumption immediately. This is his warning, recorded in three lectures and an interview. Humans share with all other species two extremely important properties that most people never think about. The first is that, and there's no exception, we, we have no exception to this in every experimental context that we've tried, all species will expand to fill the available habitat. All right? And if you think of humans, and this being a characteristic of species, we're better at it than any other. The second thing we do, as do all other species, is use up all accessible resources. And again, we're unique here, better at it than any other species, uh, because of technology. Sometime in the late 70s or 1980s, we actually exceeded global carrying capacity, meaning that the productivity of the primary ecosystems supporting humankind, um, the primary productivity was exceeded by the rate of consumption by the existing human population. Your ecological footprint is a simple measure of how much of the earth is needed to support just you. So what I attempted to do in, in putting this together with some of my wonderful students was to see whether we couldn't trace our consumption flows back to the land. So how much land do you need to produce all your consumption goods and to assimilate your wastes? That's what your ecological footprint is. And so we've done this now for many different lifestyles for most of the countries in the world. And here are some of the just very bare findings. The average per capita footprint of people in rich countries like Canada ranges between four or five all the way up to 10 hectares per person. In the poor countries though, people get by on less than half a hectare, less than an acre. That is the entire amount of land needed to produce everything they consume and assimilate their wastes. As the human eco footprint goes up, then the so-called living planet index an index based on the biomass and species diversity of other organisms is in steady decline. There is no way around this. Any politician who says to you there's no conflict between the growth of the economy and maintaining the quality of uh, the natural environment doesn't know what he or she is talking about. Historically, it's always been this way. The more humans take, the less there is available for non-human species, and the dis this decline is accelerating. Most countries in Europe, just to look at France, Germany, Netherlands, and Japan, not in Europe, but Asia, another high income, densely populated country, the red bars are their per capita ecological footprints. The green bars is a measure of the per capita domestic biocapacity. And what you see in each of these countries' cases is that they exceed by a factor of four to seven the carrying capacities of their domestic territories. So the countries like the Netherlands or Japan live almost entirely on imported biocapacity or by dumping their wastes into the global commons or shipping it literally off to uh, countries elsewhere. So this is a product of globalization. In the absence of that free flow of negentropy and entropy, then each country would confront its own ecological limits. But if you have access to the whole world, no need to do that. You can continue to grow, you can continue to consume, but in the process, you're drawing down the remaining capital assets, the remaining resource assets of the rest of the world. How many of you have credit cards? <laughs> Remember, it, it just occurred to me, I was talking about deficit. Remember I said that human beings have a tendency to use all available resources? How many of you actually carry a balance on your credit card? Come on, admit it. Okay, so I just read yesterday that Canadians now have the largest per capita debt ever. And what it means is that when we run out of resources, like income, we invent 
resources to enable us to keep consuming, right? So not only do we consume everything available, we invent pseudo resources to enable us to consume even beyond that. And the result is that we now have the largest per capita personal debt on the planet. But what the point I'm really getting at is that's trivial. You know, if we didn't pay it off, it wouldn't matter. Nothing would change. But if we don't pay this off, we're done, we're done for. for. There's plenty of evidence that previous cultures have gone through repeated cycles of, of rising to a pinnacle of achievement followed by fairly rapid disintegration and collapse when they didn't pay attention to the ecological signals or the social signals, whereas that has happened on numerous occasions on a regional scale. We're now seeing the same symptoms emerge on a global scale. Collapse, if and when it happens again, will this time be total. World civilization will collapse as a whole. Joseph Tainter, anthropologist. I mean, it's a great irony in that human beings think of themselves as intelligent life on Earth, but we really don't pay much attention to our own science. Scientists who have been interested in these issues for decades have been warning us. This was issued in 1992 after the Rio Summit on Environment and Development. And so we, the undersigned senior members of the world scientific community, by the way, including most of the world's Nobel laureates in the sciences, hereby warn all humanity of what lies ahead. A great change in our stewardship of the earth and the life on it is required of vast human misery is to be avoided, and our global home on this planet is not to be irretrievably mutilated. Well, nobody paid any attention. And 13 years later, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment was published. At the heart of this assessment is a stark warning. Human activity is putting such a strain on the natural functions of the Earth that the ability of the planet's ecosystems to sustain future generations can no longer be taken for granted. We've now seen data that suggests that since about 2000, the rate of CO2 emissions have increased by about 35% above the worst case scenario assumed by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So we're really losing track of that. Our models simply aren't working. They're much too optimistic, even though they seem to be quite pessimistic. The real inconvenient truth is that we don't want to change a damn thing that we're doing. We will do anything possible to delude ourselves into thinking that we can not only maintain our current high-end material lifestyle, but continue to grow it at three or 4% per year and extend it to the rest of the world. The Tyndall Center, one of the major contributors to the IPCC report, says that to avoid that critical mean global temperature increase above 2 Celsius degrees, we must reduce our carbon emissions by 90% by 2050. Temperatures are now within 1 Celsius degree of the maximum temperature that has been reached on Earth in the last million years. So again, we're well beyond the normal range of statistical variation, getting up into the extremes. It is very unlikely, by which the IPCC means less than 10% a chance that the world can avoid a potentially catastrophic mean global temperature increase of 2 Celsius degrees. Listen to this language. It is very unlikely that we can avoid a potentially catastrophic increase in mean global temperature of 2 Celsius degrees. We have to recognize that sustainability is a collective problem. It's the single greatest collective problem ever confronted by human beings. Studying this subject for this mm -hmm. long, does it ever get just plain frustrating for you? Oh, it's always frustrating. <laughs> well, it's been frustrating from the beginning, and I've gone through many, many uh, periods in my own career where I had to kind of shift focus, just as I was getting a little smarter. As a scientist, when I started out, I thought it was all about data. We all have this illusion, and certainly every grant application I've ever seen goes out saying, you know, we need more data on this to make better decisions about that. Not true. We've got all the data we need. Data makes almost no difference in the decision-making arena if it flies in the face of the current paradigm. So we, we've got a situation here where we delude ourselves, again, into thinking we're a science-based species, but in fact, if the science doesn't support the existing political ideology, it's ignored. The science that's accepted is the science that sustains or supports the existing ideology. It's a great human 
a perceptual tragedy. You know, we don't even talk about citizens anymore. Right? We're not citizens, we're consumers. That's the niche that we as individuals have now been allocated in a capitalist society. Most people aren't aware, but in the post-war period, in the late 40s and through the 1950s, there was a conscious um, effort on the part of the private sector in North America to turn people from being conservers into consumers. People had come through the Great Depression getting along with very little. They'd come through the rationing of the Second World War getting along with very little. We weren't consuming very much. This was a disaster from the point of view of those who saw the growth economy as the beacon of hope for all and the future. And so industry got together and effectively created the modern advertising industry with the primary goal of turning us all into consuming machines. So our enormously productive economy demands that we make consumption our way of life, that we convert the buying and use of goods into rituals, that we seek our spiritual satisfaction and our ego satisfaction in consumption. We've made ourselves into consuming machines based on the sense that our self-worth, our sense of, of self-esteem resides in our capacity to chew up the planet. What an absurdity. And yet we've all fallen for it. Um, hook, line, and sinker. Growth has brought us enormous benefits, but it's leaving an increasing number of people behind, and some, the lower 10%, are actually worse off than they have been over the last 20 years. Here's an example of, of what I'm getting at. In, in, this is a photograph I took from my hotel window in Suzhou, China. This was a, a clear day. Now, I show you this because it's what they're used to, but it's also indicative of our own uh, lack of sensitivity around these issues. This summer, both the Globe and the National Post were talking about uh, China becoming one of the great polluters on the planet and now reaching the same level in total of carbon dioxide emissions as the United States. But the fact of the matter is that most of the production in China is for consumption in Europe, North America, Japan, Australia, in the rich countries. This is the North American, the European, the Australian ecological footprint in China. The reason we have such pristine air in Vancouver is because we don't do anything here that, uh, <laughs> that would contribute uh, to that pollution. We've quite happily taken advantage of the terms of trade on the World Trade Organization to offload our most polluting industries into the third world. The masses have never thirsted after truth. They turn aside from the evidence. We don't pay attention to the evidence if the myth that we are following uh, makes us happier. The goal of an economy is to sustainably improve human well-being and quality of life. Material consumption and GDP are merely means to that end, not ends in themselves. Robert Costanza, Ecological Economist. We will tell lies to each other about the power of technology, about the fact that historically we've survived, so we're going to survive indefinitely into the future. We don't have to do anything serious uh, to change our lifestyle, we can cope with the climate change issue, with global change, with ecological decay, uh, through technological means of one kind or another. And we see over and over again reference to the new green technologies. It's virtually an article of faith among environmental groups, among all kinds of groups in society, that we have the capacity. So we're riding on this, this wave of optimism that comes from uh, some of our history, but from the statements of Nobel laureate economists and management scientists like Julie 